Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, we would love you to. You can do so at patreon.com forward slash the History Network and you can literally become a patron for as little as a few cents and every little helps. Thanks to all of you who have signed up recently and we really do appreciate all of our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network dot all podcast season thirty three episode six Heroism in the Hundred Days Offensive. This episode was written by Murray Darm. Murray, as you will all know, I'm sure, is an ancient and medieval military historian from New Zealand, living in Australia. He has written more than a hundred articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history as well as other historical topics from all periods, ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is the author of Macedonian Phalangite vs Persian Warrior, Athenian Hoplite vs Spartan Hoplite and Leuctra 371 BC, all from Osprey Publishing. He is our regular writer on here and also a regular on the Ancient Warfare podcast. Cyril Frisby and Thomas Jackson On the 27th of September 1918, Captain Frisby and Lance Corporal Jackson led the assault against enemy machine gun positions during the Battle of the Canal du Nord, the Nord-Pas-de-Calais region of northern France. Following the successes of the German Spring Offensive in March 1918, the Allies launched a series of successful counter-attacks from May to July 1918, which forced the Germans to fall back. These counter-attacks were followed by a series of Allied thrusts to push the Central Powers back, which have become known as the Hundred Days Offensive, beginning with the Battle of Amiens in early August. These campaigns drove the Germans out of France and back to the Hindenburg Line, or Siegfried position, running from Arras to La Faux on the Aisne River. Breaking through the line would significantly contribute to bringing the First World War to a successful close for the Allies. Success at Amiens was followed by attacks launched in the north at Albert, according to Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig's plans to avoid massive losses. The forces involved consisted mainly of men from Great Britain and the Commonwealth, especially Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Further successes at Mont-Saint-Quentin, Bapaume, the Second Battle of the Somme, followed. These attacks met determined resistance, but were eventually successful, with the Allies taking the Drocourt Quayon line on September the second. This was Wottenstellung to the Germans, Wotten position, the west edge of the Hindenburg line defences. On the night of September the second, the Germans fell back to the Canal du Nord. Further assaults across a wide front pushed the Germans back to the Hindenburg line during September at Havrincourt, Saint Miel and Epey, Allied attacks carried out by forces from nearly every Allied army. Allied Supreme Commander Generalisme Ferdinand Fox's Grand Offensive on the Hindenburg Line itself began on September 26th with units from the French and American Expeditionary Force attacking the Meuse Argonne, followed by Belgian, British and French troops attacking at Ypres in Flanders on the 28th. The British 4th Army, consisting of British, Australian and American troops, began its assault on September 29th at the Battle of Saint-Quentin Canal. The attack on the Canal du Nord was launched on the 27th of September by the British 3rd Army, consisting of troops from Britain, Canada and New Zealand, deliberately planned to occur one day after the Meuse-Argonne offensive and a day before the Flanders campaign so that Allied forces would not be met with huge numbers of German reserves which could have been brought to bear against a single Allied attack. The Canal du Nord was an 
incomplete canal system which stretched from the Ulse River to the Dunkirk Scheldt Canal. It had been dug in 1913, but the sections of the canal were in various states of completion when war broke out in 1914 and work on the canal ceased. This meant that in some sections the ground was difficult and boggy, whilst in others the incomplete canal workings created almost perfect fortifications for the defending German forces. The retreating German forces also exacerbated the terrain by flooding and damming various sections to hold up an Allied advance or force them into the fields of fire of the copious machine gun and field artillery positions they had set up to defend the line of the canal. The Germans also destroyed several bridges over sections of the canal, forcing the Allies to assault their pre-prepared positions across difficult terrain. The Canal du Nord faced both the British Third and First Armies. The Third Army was also expected to provide support for the British Fourth Army in the assault which would launch on September 29th. Speed in achieving the aims of the assault was therefore essential. Several of the other offensives became bogged down after initial success in the Meuse-Argonne and Flanders campaigns. Breaching the Canal du Nord would, however, leave the path open to Cambrai. The British First Army was tasked with crossing and penetrating the Canal du Nord northwest of Cambrai, while the Third Army would need to take the canal as far as the Scheldt Canal, and so be in a position to support the Fourth Army assault on Saint-Quentin, on the 29th. Although it was mainly an infantry action necessary because of the terrain, some tanks were incorporated into the attack. The 1st Battalion of the Coldstream Guards were part of the 3rd Army, posted on the extreme left of the line of the 3rd Army. This was in keeping with their regimental motto, Nullis Secundus, second to none and they were characteristically placed on the extreme left of the line so that they would literally be second to none. The Coldstream Guards were tasked with securing a crossing of the Canal du Nord on the Demicourt Grand Corps Road, almost directly west of Cambrai. The attack was launched at 5.20am on the 27th in total darkness immediately to the Coldstreamers' North, the Canadian Corps, part of the First Army, was tasked with capturing the important high ground in Borlon Wood. Cyril Hubert Frisby was acting captain of a company of the Coldstream Guards for the assault on the canal. Frisby had enlisted as a private in the Hampshire Regiment in 1916 and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Coldstream Guards in March 1917. The Coldstream Guards had always suffered high casualties among its officers and so 2nd Lieutenant Frisby was put in command of a company as acting captain. Born in Barnet, Hertfordshire, Frisby was eligible to join the Coldstreams since Barnet had been a stop on George Monk's 425-mile march from Coldstream to London in 1659 1660, and the counties through which Monk had marched remained the recruitment corridor for the Coldstream Guards Regiment. This was unusual for the British Army since most regiments were open to anyone from the four home nations. As the attack was launched across the canal, Frisby witnessed the leading platoon come under annihilating machine gun fire from a strong machine-gun nest situated under an iron bridge on the far side of the canal. The platoon was unable to advance even when waves of reinforcements arrived. Captain Frisby realised immediately that unless the machine-gun nest was taken, the entire advance would fail. If the advance failed there, then the contemporaneous assaults on the canal to the north and south would also be jeopardised. Frisby knew what needed to be done, and called for volunteers to follow him across. The first man to volunteer was Lance Corporal Thomas Norman Jackson. Jackson was from Swinton, near Doncaster, in South Yorkshire, and was 17 when war broke out in 1914. 
He volunteered in the 1st Battalion of the Coldstream Guards in September 1916, also being from the traditional recruitment corridor of the regiment. Two other men also volunteered to accompany Captain Frisby, and together the four men dashed to the canal edge and climbed down over the barbed wire into the dry canal bed under intense point-blank machine-gun fire from the enemy nest. They ran forward and succeeded in capturing the machine-gun post, taking two guns and twelve prisoners. In capturing the machine-gun post, the four men engaged in desperate hand-to-hand fighting. Frisbee was wounded in the leg by a bayonet thrust, but remained at his post to command further actions during the day. For both Frisbee and Jackson, this action was the mainstay of their recommendation that they be awarded the Victoria Cross. Both men's citations, however, highlight their further actions later the same morning. According to Frisbee's citation, by his personal valour and initiative, he restored the situation and enabled the attacking companies to continue to advance. The actions of Frisbee, Jackson and their colleagues enabled the advance of the Coldstream Guard Company to his right, which had lost all of its officers and sergeants. He organised its defences and, with them, held off a fierce German counter-attack. Some sections of the canal were impregnable, but luckily the structure was incomplete and sections such as the one taken by Frisbee and Jackson could be taken and others such as the Meuvre could be circumvented. Lance Corporal Jackson went forward from the captured machine gun post to other tasks. Later that day his company was ordered to clear an enemy trench. Jackson was the first man into the enemy trench, encouraging his comrades with cries of come on boys as he led the charge. He entered the trench and killed the first two Germans he encountered but was then shot in the head and killed instantly. The citations for both these men praise the exemplary nature of their conduct for others to emulate. Frisbee being a splendid example to all the ranks and Jackson's conduct was exemplary throughout the whole day until he was killed this young NCO showed the greatest valour and devotion to duty and set an inspiring example to all. Lance Corporal Jackson was buried with full honours in Sanders Keep Military Cemetery, Grand Corps Les Avrincourt. His fiancée and sister were presented with his Victoria Cross on March 29, 1919, by King George V at Buckingham Palace. Captain Frisby received his Victoria Cross at the same investiture ceremony. North of the Coldstreamers, the Canadian Corps had constructed wooden bridges to cross the canal since it was flooded in their sector. The Bourlon Woods and its high ground was captured. Indeed, by the end of the 27th, all objectives were reached. In addition to the two Victoria Crosses awarded to Frisbee and Jackson of the Coldstream Guards, another ten Victoria Crosses were awarded to participants in the Battle of Canal du Nord, both amongst the Canadians and in other Guard regiments south of the Coldstreamers, the Grenadier Guards and other regiments at Fles and most for their conduct in crossing the canal at various points and in the face of extreme enemy machine gun fire. Perhaps the most perplexing incident of the Battle of Canal du Nord happened on the 28th September just south of the Coldstream Guard position at Marquin where another Victoria Cross was earned by Private Henry Tandy of the 5th Battalion Duke of Wellington's West Riding Regiment. After taking the village of Marquin, a retreating and wounded German soldier entered Tandy's rifle sights, but Private Tandy chose not to fire. The soldier apparently nodded his thanks and moved along. According to some accounts, that German soldier was Gefreiter, Lance Corporal Adolf Hitler. We know Hitler was wounded in a British mustard gas attack at Ypres on October 15th, 1918, so his presence at Marquin in late September is possible.
The Allied victory at the Canal du Nord was hard won and costly, although the enemy were on the defensive and had suffered reverses in the months leading up to the battle, they put up a fierce resistance and mounted several determined counter-attacks during the battle. The Hindenburg Line was breached on September 29th, 1980, at the Battle of Saint-Quentin Canal, and the success of that battle opened up the route to Cambrai and the decisive Allied victory at the Battle of Cambrai in October 1918, notable for the relatively low number of Allied casualties. Before the war, Thomas Jackson had been employed at the Mexborough Locomotive Depot. For reasons unknown, Lance Corporal Jackson's name was not added to the Great Central Railway Memorial built in 1922. This error was corrected in 2016 when his name was added to the memorial. Frisbee returned to the London Stock Exchange after the war, where he had been a jobber, or dealer, since 1911. His brother Lionel joined him there. Lionel had been awarded a DSO with the 6th Battalion Welsh Regiment at Massimi and Pontru in September 1918. The two were ironically, if unkindly, known at the Stock Exchange as the Cowards. Thereafter, Cyril Frisby achieved fame as a sports fisherman, especially in regard to tuna. He died in 1961. Well, thanks, Murray, for another great episode for us. If you would like to write an episode for us, then do feel free to drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org, and we would love to hear about your idea. Alternatively, if you've just got an idea and don't wish to put... Uh, fingers to keyboard and write one then we'd love to hear of your idea as well the same address for that info at the history network.org and once again if you do have a few coppers jingling in your pocket then do go along to patreon.com forward slash the history network and sign up to become a patron of the podcast thank you once again to all our patrons who make this podcast possible Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast, written by Murray Darm, read by Nick Barker. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>